And good evening, everybody. Um, this is a, uh, a talk about autumn and winter birds. And I've focused my attention really just on the Winchester area rather than, than Hampshire as a whole. So you're not gonna see all the coast here. It's going to be birds you could maybe see within 10 miles or so of where you are right now. Um, yeah, so autumn and winter. So that was autumn. Here's winter. Let's hope it's not going to be like that because that is bad for birds. Many birds do decline in situations like that. And do remember, if you do get weather like that, remember to feed the birds and most importantly, put water out for the birds because they really do need it in the winter. So um, this is the area that we talk about roughly when we talk about wild Winchester. Um, for my talk, I've just taken this area. So I'm going to be mentioning a few bird watching sites that are in that in that zone. And uh, I'm going to really just take you through a number of the birds one by one. I'm going to focus quite a lot, actually, on a couple that we see at this time of the year that are just arriving. So the red wing, which is a really beautiful thrush that comes to us from Scandinavia. And it's called the red wing for that red on the underwing. But it's got a very distinctive eye stripe as well. So if you're familiar with the song thrush, it's really like a gaudy song thrush that's got painted up. It's got a bit more yellow and dark on the beak, too. So this is the red wings distribution. The, the, the reddish orange area is where they breed. So they, they do have a few in Scotland, but not many. Uh, but mainly it's a Scandinavian bird. The ones that are further east in Europe, they go south. And the ones we get come from Scandinavia and a few we get also from, uh, from Iceland as well. So there it is. And it's usually on berries. They're very much looking for berries when they first arrive, which, which was about... Uh, a month ago now, and they strip the berries off the trees. And as they strip them off, they then end up going further west because they, they kind of eat and move along to where the next lot of food is. And then eventually we get another increase as they come back again, um, perhaps in March, before leaving the country to go back to Scandinavia. This is an Icelandic one. It's got a darker head. Um, don't often see the Icelandic ones, but there must be plenty around. Um, but you really can see there the beauty of that bird with that big stripe across the top of the eye. They're not often going to see this in gardens. It will come into gardens in very cold weather, but out on the fields, on the, uh, on the open farmland, um, hedgerows, things like that. And of course, areas where there are plenty of berries on the trees. And there's a bird just taking off and you can see that beautiful red underwing, which makes it such a distinctive sight. And there they go. And you can see that red, that red very easily. They've got a very sort of jerky flight compared to a song thrush. Song thrush is quite steady the way it flies. Red wing sort of like a little bullet, um, two or three, three or four wing beats and then stops and, and, and then three or four again. So it's quite jerky in the way the way it goes. And they're, they're on bird tables in gardens sometimes, I say, particularly when it gets cold. Uh, they're quite timid, so they don't necessarily do as well as some of the more aggressive birds. They're, they're perhaps a bit easily pushed off, particularly by this bird, the field fair. Now, about a week ago, I commented on one of our chat groups that we had hardly seen any field fairs at all, that they have now arrived in very big numbers just in the last week. There were thousands arriving um, seen from sort of hillsides where people are doing what they call visible migration watches, just standing there looking to see what flies over. And the field fairs were arriving in, in thousands. So this is a bigger bird. It's about the size of a mizzle thrush, if you're familiar with that. And um, again, it eats berries. It's got a grayish head and very nice brown colors to the back. And you can see there as it flies away. And it's also got a yellowy beak. So uh, they're pretty aggressive. They'll actually chase off the middle thrushes. So they're the top of the pecking order on all these thrushes. And here are three thrushes all lined up very nicely for us. The song thrush on the left, field fair in the middle and red wing on the right, all coming down for food in the garden. So as I say, feeding birds in gardens, um, quite an important thing to do in the winter. There is quite a lot of research now to suggest that Feeding birds in gardens all through the year is not particularly helpful for two reasons, really. One is that, well, it's a bit like if you went out and bought a McDonald's rather than maybe get fresh vegetables for your kids, uh, because the McDonald's is easier to get to and the, and the vegetables, you know, it's hard to find them, um, involves a bit of effort, um, you know, and uh, Basically, um, if, you, if you've just had a McDonald's tonight, I don't want you to feel guilty about that, but have some vegetables tomorrow. 
The other thing is, uh, so you don't really want, to get to my point, you don't really want your kids eating McDonald's burgers all the time. You want them eating nice uh, insects, which they would normally feed them on. But if they can get peanuts easier, they'll feed them on peanuts. And that's not good for young birds. That's the point I'm trying to make. The second point that's being discussed now is that actually feeding birds in gardens all year actually keeps birds that are weak and unwell alive at a time when perhaps they should just be allowed to quietly go into a corner and die and make space for more healthy birds. Now, that's a bit of a rough argument, but it's a tough one, really. But it does actually make some sense that it's keeping the population at an artificially high level, which may not be good for the birds in some cases. Anyway, plenty of great tits on this nut pot, um, and they really are enjoying their food. I thought I'd just quickly remind you of one or two of the commoner birds we get. These tits are um, roughly in order of how common they are coming to your feeders. So blue tit top left, very common indeed. If you actually were able to individually identify every single individual blue tit coming to your, your nut pot or your bird table, you'd probably get something like 50 in a day. They'll come in from all around and they, they, they're very clever. They don't just go to one garden. They just work their way around all the gardens and do them in order, depending on who's got the best food. Great tit next with the black cap on the head. Coal tit bottom left, also with a black cap, but with a white stripe on the top of the head. They are really less common. They are quite timid. They're smaller than the others and they usually get beaten up. So they don't come in too often. Um, you probably see those if you live near a piece of woodland. And then bottom right, or if you're really lucky, marsh tit. Marsh tit is a declining species in our woodlands, whereas the other ones are doing really well. Um, and that is a bird that if you live in the countryside, there's a chance you might get that coming to your bird table. And you might also get long-tailed tits, which are a delight to see. And when you get one, you probably get six or seven. They go around as family groups for the rest of the year after they've all hatched out. Amazing bird, really, because the first brood of chicks helps the parents to feed the second brood of chicks. So there's a very big bond between these birds, and they all stick together during the winter before then heading off to, to breed. And actually, they don't all breed. And the ones that don't breed, if, for example, if the chicks don't breed in their first year as adults they'll hang around and help their parents so they're very very cooperative now i saw this bird today this is a brambling brambling is a finch very much like a chaffinch which arrives in the winter it comes from scandinavia that's only just been in the last month or so now they tend to go into areas of beech wood i saw mine in the new forest today but we do get a few in gardens occasionally but if you live near beech woods or you're walking through somewhere like crab woods you might find uh, a brambling on the ground. So, so look out for those. That's how they tend to look at this time of the year. They're not brightly colored like they are in the spring. So kind of orangey colored rather than pink like a chaffinch. And when they fly, they've got a white rump. And I asked everyone to look out for black caps recently. Black caps are um, a, a summer migrant basically to Europe from Southern Europe and, and Africa. But it's really interesting. I'll show you in a moment a map of the black cap distribution. Male on the left, female on the right. And many of you I know, because you replied, are seeing black caps in your gardens. Now, here is the map. Again, like before, the pinky sort of area is where they are breeding in summer. The blue area is where they go in winter. Now, the purple area is areas where they're present all the time. Now, for us, really, black cap is a summer migrant, but as you can see, we're showing it as purple, which means it's there all the time. But if you look at the arrows, the black caps we have in winter come to us from Central Europe, and the black caps that are with us in the summer head down to Southern Europe in the winter. So it's a bit like everybody changing, you know, sort of like musical chairs, really. Everybody moves around uh, until the music stops. So do please let me know. Uh, later on, if you see black caps, if you're seeing them, just give a note of how many, male or female, and, and if, if so, what dates, if you can. Now, some of you do see this bird, the lesser red pole. Now, in years gone by, this just used to be known as red pole. And frankly, that was a much easier time because you just said, oh, yeah, I've seen a red pole. But this one's now called the lesser red pole, which doesn't really help people because when they go to a list of birds, they see common red pole. I think, oh yeah, well, common red pole, that's probably the one I've seen. But actually, common red pole is very rare. 
In Hampshire, there are maybe just two or three sightings of common red poll every year. And if you look at it, it's a very different looking bird. It's really frosty in color. It's from the continent. It's from the higher northern parts of the continent and it only comes to us in really cold winters. So if you see a red poll with that red on the top of the face, it is going to be this one, the lesser red poll. Um, so I, I, it wasn't named by a British person. That's probably what it is. We might mostly name most of the birds, but uh, that one was obviously named by somebody else, perhaps an American. Anyway, um, another bird you might see is the siskin. Now these come into our gardens. They breed in Hampshire, in pine woods and things like that. Um, the red poles, by the way, don't really breed in Hampshire now. Perhaps there might be the odd pair, but they really are from further north. Siskins, though, do breed in our woodlands. And uh, there's the male, really gaudy yellow in colour. There's the female, much more uh, mottled and stripy. But the local birds are augmented by others that have come in from Scandinavia and, and elsewhere. So we see those, if, you, if you've got a, a nut pot uh, or a nut bag, you'll get those very much. So moving away from your gardens to the other areas, the, the rivers and the, the lakes and so on around Winchester, um, the great crested grebe is one that you will see in a few places. Um, this is a, a distinctive looking bird. About 150 years ago, they were killed in large numbers to make um, hand muffs. Um, thankfully, that all died out over the years. And there is a, a beautiful great crested grebe in winter plumage. In the summer, they've got big orange ear tufts. So that's the great crested grebe. There's also the little grebe, which we see. It's a smaller bird, as the name suggests and um, it tends to lurk around the bottoms of the trees on the riverbank and so on. So perhaps on you know, the Itchen Navigation Canal or something like that. Uh, also around some of the ponds. A bird we don't have many uh, breeding is, is potchard. Now potchard's a rare breeder in Britain, but many more of them come in from continental Europe, Germany, for example. Uh, a lot of them come from there. This is the male potchard. You might see that on some of the lakes. Um, the female is um, same sort of layout. If I just go back to the male, you'll see the layout there. Female sort of similar, but with brown coloration. Females are almost always duller than the males because as, you know, if you're trying to hide when you're nesting, it's not much point looking like that, is there really? Um, the male tufted duck, similarly black and white, and therefore would be hopeless if it was sitting on a nest because it would be spotted immediately. Um, but uh, female tufted ducks are much browner. They both have that lovely orangey yellow eye and they're here all year, but they also come in larger numbers during the winter. Their, their populations are augmented. And another bird that we have all year is the gadwall. It's a bit like a mallard in many ways, but the thing on this male bird to look at is the back end. It's very black round the back. So if you're seeing a gray bird with a black back end, that's probably going to be a male gadwall. The female gadwall, really looks like a female mallard in many ways, but her beak is really very, very orange. Um, a mallard beak is normally um, kind of brown. This is really distinctly orange. And another bird that we get more of at this time of the year um, is shoveler. And we don't really get them during the summer, very rarely anyway, but uh, they do come in to some of the lakes and um, the shoveler gets the name from this extraordinarily large beak. This is the male with his gaudy plumage. They're looking very good at the moment. I saw some today. And uh, here's the female. Um, again, they're much duller color, but you can really see the size of that beak. And they use that beak to really shovel along the bottom of the, uh, the pond, getting crustaceans and things like that, sieving from side to side furiously. Teal is a bird that nests in the new forest, but really the ones we get are in the winter. And this is the male with his red and green head. And at the back end of him, he's got yellow, which is quite easy to spot. And the female, uh, again, brown in color, but she does have a very attractive green flash on the wing. Now the teal is our smallest duck. They tend to fly off quite quickly. They're usually quite timid. So if you go to somewhere like Alsford Pond, you're probably gonna see many of those birds that I've just shown to you. Occasionally, though, you might get this as well, and particularly in a cold winter, the golden eye, a bird that comes from Scandinavia and the northern parts of Scotland, the male on the right, female on the left. It's got a golden eye, but so has the tufted duck, so don't get misled by that. Um, but it's a, a, a bird that's much more 
um, well, the, the head shape is much more sort of bulbous, um, quite an unusual looking bird. And the male has that big white patch by his beak. So they tend to be when you have cold weather. And similarly, you might see goosander if it's cold weather. Goosander are on uh, one or two of the ponds in the New Forest, Iworth Pond, for example, in particular. Um, but they do turn, turn up from time to time uh, with their very long and slightly down curved beaks. So they, they actually do nest on the River Avon in small numbers, but primarily they're a winter visitor to Britain. Now, once in a while, we get bitterns. We've been very lucky actually down at Fish Lake Meadows near Romsey to have bitterns in the summer as well. We're hoping they're going to breed. They've been booming as well, which is the thing they do in the spring. The male does a very loud boom, um, but really they're shy birds. They don't like to be seen and they are designed not to be seen. They look just like a reed bed when they're sitting still and they put their neck up straight. I guess if you want to see one of those, the best thing you could do is to go down to Blashford Lakes in the Avon Valley, Hampshire Wildlife Trust Reserve, and go to the Ivy Lakes Hyde. Um, and from there, you've got a chance of seeing bitten. You might have to get there early, though, because people do tend to park themselves in front of the best window and, uh, and don't move. Egrets are something we never used to see. I can remember going to see my first little egret, um, probably about 1987, and I you know, rushed down to the coast to see it. Now, little egrets are easy to see. They are um, on the coast in good numbers. They arrived in the late 1980s, early 90s, as the population in France really grew, and now they're part of our population too. And they've got bright yellow feet, the little egrets with a black beak, and they nest in several places along the coast and, and just inland. So we see these up the valleys, up the Itchin Valley uh, in particular. You'll see them perhaps at Alsford Pond, places like that. So that's the little egret. They don't, uh, they don't nest around our area, but they are nesting up at, for example, Alice Holt um, near Farnham. Now, another egret which has arrived more recently is this one, the great white egret, and it's about twice the size of the little egret. And this bird, again, is a European bird that made it here a few years ago. We used to just have one or two. Now we have more like sort of 10 or 20 every year um, and they hang around and they probably will breed somewhere like Fish Lake Meadows in the next five years. They really are a big bird. And you can see compared to the little egret, little egret's got a black beak. Great white eagle has got a yellow beak. One of the wading birds that we get in the winter in the Winchester area is the green sandpiper. So um, sort of places where you might see that would be, for example, Headbourne Worthy on the crest beds there or the crest beds um, just to the north of Alsford Pond, um, Pinglestone, for example. So the green sandpiper, when it flies off, has got a very distinctive white tail, white with a bit of black on it, and a, a sort of very obvious white rump as it flies off there. So that's a very distinctive looking bird. So if you see something flying off that looks black and white like that, then that's going to be a green sandpiper, I think. You might also, though, see snipe. And snipe arrive for winter. Um, we have them breeding in the New Forest, but elsewhere they, they don't breed. And uh, these are going to be on some flooded fields, they might be on the edges of um, reedy ponds and things like that. And when a snipe goes off, um, you might just get that very nice plumage. Again, a bit like a bittern, designed to look like a reed bed in flight. It doesn't want to be spotted. Uh, long beak and uh, usually flies off pretty quickly when you arrive. Um, so notice it hasn't got any white on the back end. So if it's, if it's a brown thing, chances are it's going to be a snipe. You might, though, occasionally flush this, a woodcock, which would be almost always in the woods. And if you're out with a dog, I mean, dogs very often do flush woodcock. Uh, they're a big bird. They fly off a bit like a pheasant, a big kind of, you know, crashing of leaves as they take off. But look for the long beak. Really amazing um, camouflage. They do actually go out on the fields at night. So if you've got a thermal imager, you'll be able to look for those because they are actually out on the fields probing around, particularly in wet mud. But they're, they're a shy bird and they don't like to be seen. Lapwings, of course, we have those all year, but we get more of them in the winter. And they're joined by this, the golden plover, here in its winter plumage without its black breast. And um, places up around sort of 
on a, on his battery on the fields there. There are golden plovers in with the lapwings on the fields there, and you see them flying around. They're lovely. They're they're lovely, sort of soft, fawny brown in colour, and uh, they make a little whistling sound as they go. So they're worth looking out for as well. Only with us in the the winter. Now we get more gulls in winter than we do in the summer. So this is the black-headed gull. Loses its black head in the winter. Just has this dot behind the eye. Um, it's the only gull you're likely to see in or around Winchester with a red beak. And out on the farmlands, you might get Mediterranean gulls, but I haven't included that. But this is the black-headed gull. Then you've got the common gull with a yellow beak and yellow legs. And they are not common, despite the name. Again, I don't know who named that one. Uh, it's a sort of uncommon gull. And occasionally, herring gulls. Herring gulls, though, are more of a coastal bird. Um, so whereas going back, common gull had yellow legs, the herring gull has pink legs and is a bigger bird all round. And then you've got a couple of birds with black backs, but the one we mainly see around Winchester is the lesser black back gull. They actually nest in a few places not far from Winchester as well, but they're, they're here in good numbers in the winter. Blackish back, sort of greyish back, I suppose you might say dark grey and yellow legs. Now, if you're really lucky, you'll get to see one of these. And there, there was one up near, I think, Sutton Scotney a couple of winters ago, um, a short-eared owl. And they are occasionally seen up near Bransbury Common, further up in the Test Valley. Um, short-eared owls are only here in the, in the winter. And uh, they're a delight to see if you do. They're like a huge moth. Um, but they don't like to be seen, so they do hide rather well. But they don't hide as well as this one, the long-eared owl. Now, we have long-eared owls in Hampshire, but it is the hardest bird to see. I know of a couple of places where they nest, and I don't tell anybody because, frankly, they would be hounded to death because so many people want to see this bird. It is the master of disguise. It really does hide itself away. There will be some, probably not that far from Winchester nesting, um, probably in a big hedgerow, but they don't show themselves. They're so good at hiding. One or two small birds. The meadow pipit is a common bird of fields and farms on, on the, in the winter. We don't have many breeding, but they are here in good numbers, both in winter and on spring migration. So they're a little tiny thing. If you see one, you're probably going to see 10. They're in together in flocks. Quite often actually near wet fields, um, they like going to the edges of watercress beds as well. But the thing you've got to be aware of is this, this bird, the water pipit. Now, this is actually a bird you're not likely to find on the farms, but you are likely to find it on watercress beds. So something like Pinglestone crest beds down near Alsford, this is a much bigger pipit, the water pipit. And it actually comes to us from the Alps. These birds breed in the Alps in the summer in France and, and Switzerland, and then they come to us in the winter. Not a common bird at all. If you're looking for it, you need to look. It's got a much more obvious eye stripe. It's a bigger bird, um, probably about, you know, a third bigger than a meadow pipit. And it will be walking amongst the crest beds, whereas the meadow pipit's more likely to be on the grass that's surrounding the crest beds. So one to look out for. Stone chats, well, we see them on the heaths and they are a common heathland bird. But in winter, they move out of the heathland areas, very often just to avoid all the snow and, and the risk of getting snowed in. And we find them on farmlands and hedgerows all around the edges of Winchester and up and down the valleys. Now, this is a female bird. Um, the male has a slightly darker head in winter, but it's a nice bird to look for. And uh, they're, they're quite approachable. They're eat, eating insects. If they're finding insects, they'll be so transfixed by that, they probably won't notice you're there. If you're seeing large flocks of small birds in the farms in winter, then the chances are these are going to be linnets. So if you see one linnet, you'll probably see 50. It is quite a common bird of the farms, not as common as it was, say, 20, 30 years ago, but you still, when you get them, will get flocks. And in the winter, they've lost most of their colour, so they look a bit drab and like this. And the reed bunting is quite a special bird. Um, one you'll find on the reed beds in the summer, but sometimes they'll come into gardens. And this is a male, which it's got a black head, but it's in its winter plumage. So I didn't put it in, in summer plumage, but it's got a really sooty black head. But in the winter, it's got just a slightly dark head. 
very obvious moustache or stripe we have, we call it just here. Looks like it's got a white moustache, whiskers. And that, that bird does come into garden. So it might just be at the bottom of your bird table in amongst the sparrows. Keep a lookout for it. It's got a lovely colour on the back. Now, this is a very special bird, the Black Red Star. And it's one which is with us all year, but very rarely indeed. I mean, we have, I would guess, under 10 pairs in Hampshire. They tend to be in the docks, for example, at Southampton, so we don't get to see them. Female on the left, male on the right, um, but both of them have the very obvious red tail. Now, if you see a red red start in the winter, it's going to be a black red start. The common red start is a summer migrant we see from the end of March through till October. Now, we do have occasional black red starts wintering in Winchester, namely, for example, uh, over at the hospital where, well, they actually nested there. They nested on the hospital, um, but they've been seen there in the winter too. And also down at the courts. Um, in fact, I know someone, this is quite uh, sad, he was actually up for manslaughter, um, went into the courts to be uh, to be sentenced and uh, but noted that he had a black red start singing from the roof and sent me a note before being sent down, which was very good of him. Um, waxwing, gorgeous bird. This is a, a rare bird, um, but it's a kind of all or nothing bird. So you either have none or you have a whole load. And they tend to go on places where there are berries on the trees. Um, again, as you can see, it's gorging itself on berries. So actually, quite often, they'll be in things like supermarket car parks where there are lots of uh, berry-bearing trees, catoniasters and things like that. If there are wax wings around, then the news normally goes out quite quickly. I'll tell you about going birding in a moment, which is a free service we provide at, at Hoss, um, and you can find out where the birds are. And as I say, all or nothing. So if you've if you've, got a, if you've got one, you've probably got a whole load and they all fly around like a flock. When they fly, they're like starlings to look at. And they don't really get to see humans um, because they nest very, very high up in the, you know, above the Arctic Circle. Um, so when they do arrive, if you stand um, with food, then they sort of come in. Now, you don't have to wear a hat like this, um, but this was actually in Scotland where um, the gentleman up in, up in Shetland wore that anyway and uh, here he is putting out I think an apple or something and he's got a wax ring on his hand fantastic I don't think that would happen here I think when they first arrive in Shetland they've come across from Scandinavia they're exhausted and so they go for easy food so as I said that's the area I've been talking about and where can you go in order to find birds well I've just picked half a dozen places because there are lots of places you can choose from I think we all know Winnell Moors um, you don't always see things at Winnell Moors. I mean, if you can, for example, you know, a lot of the birds are there are skulking. Now, I didn't put in a picture of a water rail, uh, but I saw a Simon photograph of a water rail the other day. And water rails are in the reeds at Winnell Moors. They make a sort of squawking sound, a bit like a pig. And um, they are there, particularly in the winter. They're not, they're probably birds that have come in from Europe. St. Catherine's Hill. Great place to go looking, um, particularly if you want to see flocks of birds flying around, um, you know, when they're, when they're flying over. So go out to Catherine, St. Catherine's Hill, always a good area. The farmlands nearby, the golf course nearby, uh, all of those areas are worth looking at. Alsford Pond, I mentioned, um, there's a nice place to go there. If you, if you go to the western side of the pond, there's a little cutout area where you can just step down and sit at a couple of um, chairs and view the pond. Uh, it's, a, it's a good a good area for birds, particularly towards the end of the day. Sometimes even see marsh harriers there and hen harriers too. Cheesefoot Head, one of my favorite areas for going for a walk across farmland. So we're east of Winchester now, um, heading towards the, on the road going out towards Petersfield and Bramdean. And Cheesefoot Head, you probably know, you can park at the car park there and then walk down over uh, Longwood Warren and all those areas around there. Nice sort of circular walks and um, great place to be to see things like you know, skylarks and maybe some thrushes. And of course, Farley Mount is a good place to go as well. Big open spaces, mixture of woodland as well. I mean, in a nice circular walk from there, um, you can do up through 
from the part from the up into Parnholt Wood and around and then back again, take you maybe two hours, three hours. Really, really good indeed. And Crabwood, not far from there. Woodland is a bit difficult for birds in winter. It tends to be a bit quiet. They don't make much sound. Uh, but near to Crabwood, there'll probably be quite a lot of birds roosting in Crabwood each evening. So you might see them flying towards the wood in the evening or flying out first thing in the day. Now, I mentioned going birding. So how do you find out about what's around? Well, just find going birding, Google it. Um, there are different going birdings in different counties. We organise in Hoss, so we organise the one for, um, for Hampshire. Um, it looks like this, and you can see it's completely free. You can see who's seen what and where. You can actually also search. For example, you can see there's a, just a search button there, uh, and you can go in and type in, for example, let's say you want to see a water rail, then type in water rail, and it'll show you in date order the sightings of water rail. Or if you're interested in knowing what you can see at Winnell Moors, you could then type in Winnell Moors and it would find all the recent sightings from there. So completely free. Uh, you don't have to be a member of HOSS to, to get that. We make it available for everybody. But you could join HOSS, which would be great. We have a very nice magazine uh, every four months called Kingfisher, 60 pages full of colour, photographs of birds taken over the last few months. An annual bird report that's just come out, um, 260 pages thereabouts, detailing everything we've had in the last year um, across Hampshire. And in addition to that, we have outings, we have Zoom talks like this one, we have indoor meetings, we have a fantastic one coming up on the 2nd of April, which will be at St Swithin's um, School. And that will be, um, Chris Packham is planning to attend that as well as our president. So um, uh, come and join Hoss. 16 pounds and uh, host.org.uk is the web address and uh, a final commercial just to say that some of you may know i've been involved in producing the fifth edition of where to watch birds in dorset hampshire and the isle of wight that was published last week and copies are in uh, i've got copies available and it's 25 pounds the price of the book um I can sign it for you and for £25, I'll also post it to you. Um, so if you would like a copy of that book signed, then there's my email address. Just drop me a note and I'll uh, correspond with you about that. Or you can find me on Facebook if you know me already and send a message. But that has details of 89 sites across those counties. And um, there's the commercial for me. Uh, so. Any questions? I'm going to put my earplugs in. Um, we've only taken 35 minutes to do that, so that's rather good. Uh, it gives us plenty of time to talk about anything you may want to ask me about. And I will uh, hand back to uh, Barry and Simon. Thanks, Keith. Um, so, yeah, as Keith has offered, happy to take some questions either. Um... By all means, uh, we haven't got too many, too many that would be uh, mad to go off uh, off mute, but probably easier if, if they're posted in the chat. Um, and then we can pick them up there if anyone's got any questions to post to Keith. And I know, as Keith just said, he'd be delighted to take any. All everyone's the, shy. Everyone's shy. Are they shy or they're just overwhelmed with all the information you shared tonight? Keith, let's go with the latter rather than the former. But um, a question from me then to start off. Go on, Simon. Um, given you're talking about the bird survey and what have you within Hampshire, what have we seen that's actually grown an awful lot or declined over the last kind of 10 years around this neck of the woods? How have things changed? Oh, good question, Simon. Uh, we're seeing changes. Uh, let's talk about the negatives, first of all. So we've seen a real drop in the number of breeding lapwings on the farms nearby. Um, we've seen probably overall a drop in farmland birds over the last 25 years. Just the volume of birds, the species range is still the same. There's just fewer individual birds, fewer yellow hammers um, and things like that. Um, so those declines have been driven perhaps by habitat loss. Some of the farmers have grubbed out hedgerows, although I'm pleased to say uh, plenty of them are now putting hedgerows back in. Um, and we've also seen a change that's been driven by climate change. As the climate warms, some of those birds prefer it if it's uh, a bit cooler, and they get that by going further north. So birds like the willow tit 
which we used to have in reasonable numbers around Winchester, it's just completely disappeared. Uh, but if you go to somewhere like Leicester, they're the, the commoner, one of the commoner clips up there. So, um, so that's the, uh, the change negatively. If we're looking at birds that have moved into the area, well, straight away, the little egrets, we never had it before. And now you can see little egret reasonably easily uh, around the, the sort of central southern part of Hampshire up the river valleys. Uh, we have birds um, like the Mediterranean gull that um, was only discovered nesting in Britain in 1967, actually in Hampshire. But we have now 1,700 pairs just nesting in Langston Harbour. And quite a lot of those come up the South Downs, for example, over uh, around Wheelie Down, those sorts of places and feed in the, the summer. And we also have firecrests. Firecrests, again, were discovered nesting in, in Hampshire in about 1961 in the New Forest. We probably have 2,000 pairs now. So it's not all negative. There's some pluses and minuses. The overall thing where there's a minus is in the volume of birds rather than the range of species, because where there might have been 10 pairs, maybe there are now only five. Thank you. Keith, no problem. A couple of questions or two or three questions come in. So I'll go in order they came in. Uh, the first one was about you, you mentioned about feeding um, and, and some of the thought processes out there about the pros and cons about feeding throughout the year. The question is, when is the best time not to feed birds? If, if, if there's to cause a pause in that feeding habit from, from, from us, what, when's the best time not to feed? Best time not to feed is when birds can easily find natural food themselves. So um, in the summer, there's plenty of food around for them. There are many, many insects. It's better that they actually feed on the natural food when it's available. The time to feed is when the ground is covered, they can't find food easily, and in winter generally, because you know it's a it's a tougher time for them. Uh, so hopefully that's a that's a simple answer to that one. Uh, switching completely uh, away from our back gardens, though, gosh, wouldn't that be a sight to see a white-tailed eagle in the back garden? Um, been a lot of interest in white-tailed eagles over the last two three years. Um, question posed about a likelihood of seeing them in Hampshire, Keith. I know uh, well. I know, I know some of that, but I'll, I'll defer to you to answer that question. OK, so the white-tailed eagle is a bird that, uh, first of all, was present. So I'm going to give you a long answer here. So they nested in um, southern England up until about 250 years ago. They were killed by man and they stopped nesting. Last place was on the Isle of Wight at, a, at Culver Cliff. So the decision was made to bring them back to Scotland about 50 years ago. And that worked. And then now they've decided to take some of the birds in Scotland and take them to the Isle of Wight. So that started in 2019. I think there were seven brought down in 2019, nine brought down in 2020. And this year, there were 12 birds brought down as chicks. Where there was a nest, for example, in Scotland, where there were two chicks, they'd take one of them because where there were two, usually one dies anyway, because they fight. And uh, those birds have been released and they travel around the South Coast. So the chance of seeing one in Winchester is quite low, um, but actually probably one goes over Winchester every two or three weeks, because what they do is they'll fly over on their way to somewhere else, but they don't hang around. And they probably fly quite high because they're using the winds to move them. If you want to see white-tailed eagle, then the South Coast, for example, anywhere from Key Haven east to say Calshot, they are quite often seen around those areas because the area where they've been released on the Isle of Wight is opposite that on the north coast of the Isle of Wight. And of course, if you do want a much better chance of seeing them on the Isle of Wight, you get uh, at all, you go to the Isle of Wight. And if you were to hang around, say, Newtown Marsh, uh, which is um, about, I don't know, four miles east of um, Yarmouth, then you've got a very good chance of seeing a white-tailed eagle. So the chance of seeing one over Winchester, quite slim. You, you, if you sat there for long enough and never moved, you would get one. But I honestly would find an easier way. Uh, third one posted, to give, but not so much a question, more I think a shared observation uh, relating to black caps and their changing diet throughout the year. Is that something that, that you'd, uh, you'd recognise? That changing yeah, diet? so the changing diet of black caps, uh, actually almost all birds change their diet during the year. So, so birds um, that would 
predominantly feed on insects during the winter. Some of them would actually, sorry, start again, feed on insects during the summer, will quite often switch to other types of food in the winter because it's more easily available. Um, so yeah, black caps are an insect eater. In the summer they eat insects, but in the winter they come into gardens and they feed on fat, uh, fat balls and uh, seed and stuff like that. It's just about survival really. Thanks, Keith. Uh, those were the th ones that posted. I'm obviously um, open up to anyone else with any other questions they'd like to pose to Keith. I'll pause. I can see the point the person's made there. They've said, do the winter migrants only eat fruit in their breeding ground? They actually only eat fruit in their summer, in their wintering ground. When they go back to where they breed, which is in Central Europe, they go back to eating insects. Thanks, Keith. Thanks. Any, any, any other questions for Keith? Keith, are there any other birds that you're wanting us to look out for at the moment? So I know that you were yeah. after black caps and what have you. Now for black caps, I'd always recommend the weekend of the RSPB survey. Yeah. Because pretty much I've had three winters where the garden birds were totally devastated by by black caps turning up two days before and driving off everything. So instead of 20 species, I had three species that I could note sure. and really aggressive black caps. But are yeah. you are the other things that you're after following at the moment at Haas or in your other yes. work? Well, I'd be very interested to hear from anybody who's seeing little owls because we know there are little owls. You, you yourself, Simon, have reported little owls to me. Um, also barn owls. We don't publicize these widely because obviously we don't want people um, chasing the birds. That's not good, but it is good to have a note of where they are because when planning applications come in and the local council wants to know if there are barn owls nearby, we've then got the data to say, yes, there are barn owls there and we need to, um, you know, we need to um, protect that area uh, and, and, you know, help the barn owls. Um, what else? Um, I think that's those are two that I particularly would would ask. But anything which is out of the ordinary to you, let us know. And we can do that via go birding, uh, birding and what have you as well. So. You, you can do it by going birding. If you don't want it to be made public, that's fine. There's a little icon you can click for confidential, which means that only I and my administration colleagues get to see that. Yeah, then I received the questions being posted about poison, putting down rat poison, its impact on birds, on potential. Uh, uh, okay, so rat poison is a, is a problem for birds like kites. Um, there are definitely ways that rat poison should be administered uh, to in, or, in order to not affect the, the local kites. So you put the rat poison down the hole where the rats are so that they die in the hole rather than just leaving it out generally where the rats then die out in the open and they uh, they get eaten by kites and the kites then uh, are secondary victims of the rat poison. So um, there are definitely some guidelines on that. If you're going to use rat poison, then have a look at the RSPB website. I know they've got some guidance on there on how to do it well. Ethan, you mentioned red kites there, just as a passing comment, I think we're still seeing a very good number of kites around 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 the area um and it's certainly my neck of the woods but um any comments around red kites to uh, to share yeah so red kites um are increasing of course that's another success story that we probably should have mentioned and i probably should have mentioned peregrine too you know it's funny when people say to me tell me about all the things that have increased you have to think hard peregrines of course are nesting in the middle of winchester as we know red kites are nesting just outside winchester um, we have about 500 pairs of red kites in Hampshire now, which compares to, oh, probably only 20 about um, 15 years ago at, at most. So they've really done well. Um, they get together in winter in flocks at nighttime. They go into roosts um, and you can find roosts places like Gander Down, for example, just east of uh, Winchester, not far from Cheesefoot Head. I've seen quite a few red kites circling over a wood there and they go down into the wood at night and roost there together. Could easily have 50 or so kites in one wood. So it's worth looking out for those. Those are almost all um, young birds or unmated birds. So they go there to 
to, to meet other kites and they probably also go for safety in numbers and they probably also benefit a little bit because if they haven't actually eaten terribly well, then they can leave with other kites that are more experienced and follow them. And there's a good chance of benefiting from those birds finding food and then getting to eat some of that food. So yeah, kites doing well. There are people saying maybe there are too many kites now. Well, I think most of these birds manage to sort of regulate their numbers because as you get more kites, they actually rear fewer chicks. Um, so if you go up to Reading, there are so many kites up around Reading and they only manage to rear about one chick per pair per year. Whereas in Hampshire until recently, it's been between two and three pair, two or three um, chicks per nest. And now it's probably starting to decline slightly simply because they, there isn't enough food to go around. They, they eat a lot of carrion off the road. And it's really interesting that when we had the lockdown in February, well, so it's February, March, April, 2020, probably the number of people on the roads reduced by, I don't know, 80% or something like that. And as a result, um, there, weren't, there wasn't that much roadkill. You know, rabbits were not getting knocked down in the way that they used to be. And the red kites relied on those, that roadkill to keep them going. So they became very hungry indeed. And there was a, a big move by red kites. They went off in a huge number to look for food elsewhere because they were just not, not getting enough to eat. And uh, 300 went down to Cornwall and they all went down through Dorset uh, and across Hampshire in one day. So a big, big chunk of the population went looking for food because they were just so hungry. Let's do another question around uh, cohabiting the area with uh, buzzards, Keith, um, and yeah. the relationship between the two. Yeah, they, they don't really compete in the way that you might think they do because they have a totally different way of feeding. Buzzards will sit on a fence post or in a tree and then pounce on something on the ground. They're watching the ground the whole time for live animals, uh, small rodents or birds or chicks. Whereas a kite, generally speaking, is picking up dead stuff, something which has been a victim or actually stealing it off another bird. So for example, if a, if a buzzard goes and kills a mouse, uh, then the kite will intercept the buzzard and steal the mouse off it. So the buzzard has to go back and kill another mouse. So they do, uh, they do kind of interact with each other in that respect. They, they nest in similar sorts of trees, but they can get on okay. Um, we, we don't often see buzzards and kites interacting much. And, and frankly, buzzard numbers and kite numbers have both gone up. So I don't think there's any, any difficulty. Thanks, Keith. Um... Again, just, just pausing for any more questions. I'll ask another one because I've got loads of questions at the moment, Keith. Um, you mentioned fire crests before. Um, gold crests in winter, are they more prevalent or just easier to spot? Because I, I've noticed a lot more around this winter than I've seen for quite a while. So I don't okay. know if that's just yeah, personal. I, I've just been lucky in seeing them around, but I or maybe it's just the the you know, the fact that a lot of the leaves have dropped off the trees, but you know, there seems to be a lot more than I'm used to. Well, what happens with gold crests and indeed fire crests is that they join up with tit flocks. So tits in the woods will go roaming around. You could easily get, um, for example, 30 or 40 tits in a group. I mean, it'll be quite a large group. It won't just be in one little tiny tree. They'll be over an area maybe, you know, perhaps 50 to 100 feet wide in any direction. And they'll be going around as a sort of roving flock um, and, and the gold crests and fire crests going with them. So they really do go around for safety in numbers. Um, and they will come into um, gardens and, uh, you know, they, they probably are a bit easier to see because they're lower down and they're hunting for insects low in the trees. And that, in fact, that's probably where the insects are. They're probably down lower because it's slightly warmer. I saw a question come in there. That was... Um, the red kite one, please. Yeah, so will red kites eat rook eggs or chicks? Um, yeah, I've never heard of them eating rook eggs. Uh, I don't think they could take a rook egg, but I, I, they, they might take a rook chick if it was really small. I mean, they do take lapwing chicks occasionally uh, when lapwings are stupid enough to leave their chicks and not look after them. Um, but they really, they're, you know, they're mainly a bird that's picking up things on the road. Um, I, I wouldn't rule it out, but I've never seen it. So that's all I can really say on that. Uh, what, what type of areas do sparrowhawks generally frequent? 
Well, that's an interesting question because, you know, 30, 40 years ago, sparrowhawks were very much deep woodland birds. They'd be found in the, the deepest forests. They didn't come into gardens very much. You'd be really lucky to see a sparrowhawk in the garden. And then we started feeding birds more than at any time in the past. I mean, bird food was widely available in garden centers and everybody had bird feeders. And sparrowhawks suddenly realized that it was a lot easier to go hunting birds in gardens than it was to go into woodland and be right in the middle of a wood and wait all day until something flew past. So, so now they tend to hang out round gardens. They'll still nest in the woodlands, but what you'll find is if you've got a woodland that's quite, quite close to gardens, the sparrowhawks will be on that edge where the gardens are. That's what they prefer now, because it's easier pickings. And actually, one of the arguments that some people make against feeding birds is because they say that it will attracting birds into gardens in larger numbers brings them into risky areas. So, for example, cats, um, sparrowhawks, um, maybe even just, you know, being hit by cars. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think there are clearly more risks, but I think there are more benefits to birds being in gardens than, than not. So. Thanks, Keith. Um... Simon, have you got any more questions of your, your list? Um... I'm curious to know why we've only got 25 people here tonight, because, and I think it is probably we've, a bit of a learning curve for us, because we thought about uh, having the booking system that we used to have, where you had to register if you wanted to attend, and we'd regularly have up to 120 people wanting to come to these talks, and we had to limit it to, a, to 100. Um, but when you then don't make people register, you get 25, and thank you to the 25 who came, compared to, say, 75, which is what we would have expected. So I think we've learned from that that we probably should have a booking system if we want to see the numbers at, at sensible levels. Plus, you need more peregrines. Need more peregrines. That's where we had all the people, so. Peregrine. Put a peregrine. We'll have to say, you know, peregrines and other birds of Winchester. There you go. Lesson learned there. Yeah. Keith, are you planning to do in-person talks in the, the kind of year coming up? You mean standing up in front of people? Yeah, I mean, you, previously you always used to with the Peregrine Talks, for instance. Yeah, um, well, I, I am. I mean, I've got, uh, so I've got about um, 20 talks booked in in March and April next year. But at the moment, all of those are Zoom talks because the people um, have just basically not, deci not decided what they're doing yet. Um, but once it's safe to do it and people are comfortable at do for doing it, I will definitely be out on the road. Um, Winchester RSPB group um, and the Hampshire Wildlife Trust group there. Um, we could probably even do a Wild Winchester Wildlife Day, which I think I did suggest to you before COVID suddenly arrived, because I think it would be a nice idea to have somebody on uh, me on birds, maybe somebody on butterflies, somebody on plants. And we could do uh, quite a nice event, all of us together with coffee and biscuits and, you know. Yeah, all those grand plans that we had two years ago. Well, we but the plan I had was to do it in Little, Littleton Memorial Hall, which would take the uh, best part of 100 people quite comfortably in the main hall mm -hmm. there. And um, I think it would be a nice thing to do. But at the moment, those sorts of things are just uh, a memory, really. But mm. hopefully there'll be more than a memory. We really hope that our HOSS Members Day on the 2nd of April happens because we've had, you know, in excess of 250 people come to that since Withens. But I think a lot of people are still cautious, understandably. And, uh, and it's so easy to have a talk like this. Um, so I suspect the number of talks we do in real life will be fewer now. Yeah. No, and, and thank you. No, it's uh, it, it's been great during lockdown, especially for a lot of people. And yeah, possibly this is another reason that we're a bit less tonight is the fact that people are able to go out again, whether it's, we have the the captive audiences before. Yeah, I did a, a fabulous event just recently. I, I did a talk in Northern Ireland. I wasn't there. I was sitting here at my desk, but there were six RSPB groups from Northern Ireland. They'd never, ever come together before. Um, and they all came together that evening and had about 150 people came to that. And uh, it was quite chaotic because there were a lot of people talking and hadn't seen each other in ages. Um, but uh, it was just such an amazing event. So I think we'll be doing more things like this, bringing people together easily. 
But uh, I saw somebody put their hand up and said, you know, Sally and Brian said, yeah, a Winchester Wildlife Day would be good. So I'm definitely up for organising that. Um, how common are snow buntings? Uh, Stephen's asked. Yes, snow buntings. Well, snow buntings are rare in Hampshire. We get them perhaps once every two or three years. Uh, but this year, something's happened. I don't know why, but there are snow buntings turning up in a number of places. Uh, you saw yours at, at Warsash. Um, there was also, there were seven yesterday on Hailing Island, all in one group. Um, there were six the day before. Six was the largest number since 1969. Um, so seven's probably the largest number since the 1950s. And um, I don't know why there are more than usual, but clearly something is driving them further south at the moment. Presumably it's related to food, lack of it, perhaps where they want to be. But yeah, nice bird to see. So, Good. Yeah, so Simon, Keith, I don't know you want to, oh, that was a thank you. Um, so that's another, another vote for a wildlife day. So um, food for thought for Simon and Keith there. Good. Well, we'd like to do it. I think, uh, you know, we'd very happily help you put that together, Simon. Um, and, and between us, we know all the people who know, who are specialists on, on plants yes. and uh, butterflies and moths and so on. So it would be an easy thing to do and uh, be a fun thing to do. Mm, yes, absolutely. I hope, hopefully in the spring, then, if restrictions are eased off more and people are more comfortable, the idea of actually everyone getting together and meeting each other in person will be really good. And yeah, to get all those di uh, different groups and experts in together be superb. Absolutely. Well, I'd be very happy to do a talk on, uh, you know, basically uh, spring and summer birds around Winchester. Um, I think what we should do is we'll say there's only 25 places, 250 people will therefore book for it, um, <laughs> and we'll have more people than we know what to do with. Well, it, anyway. if, if we don't have enough people, we'll just you know, drop Peregrine into the conversation. and, and, and other, be a thousand. Yes. Peregrines and other birds. Um, we're hoping to get the microphone working at Winchester Cathedral. Um, I say we. I'm hoping that they will. Um, I, I write them about once a month on it at the moment. I might have to start increasing the number of times I write. Um, I'm also hoping that the second camera will be sharper this year. The cam There's nothing wrong with the camera. It's actually to do with the speed at which the signal is being sent from the camera to the computer at the screening service and the speed with which it's then sent back to the cathedral for their computer. I don't really understand that. Um, but then the, nobody at the cathedral does either, which is why it never gets fixed. If anybody does know what I'm talking about and knows about, you know, such things, please get in touch and I'll try and see if I can get you on board to, uh, to get it right. Because the camera image is absolutely pin sharp, but uh, it doesn't come across pin sharp. Good. I, Simon, are you happy to conclude for the evening? Um, I think we are. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Barry, for taking the reins and Keith for another amazing talk. Um, yeah, great to see you all again. And hopefully we'll have something else organized in the relatively near future. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And if anybody wants, uh, wants one of those books, then uh, drop me a line and I'll happily arrange that. OK, and just a quick one, Will. Tonight has been recorded, so we'll post it to the HOS website, um, so which is free to access. So if anyone wants, wants to repeat, and, uh, go through the range of birds that Keith has covered tonight. Uh, this, the Tonight's talk will be uh, readily available, hopefully by tomorrow, but no later than day after. Yeah, and Brilliant. I'll post a link up on Wild Winchester to it as well when it goes up. Okay, Great. So, Thanks, perfect. everybody. See you Thank again. Thank you very soon. much, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.